there's different flavors of retail media, right? Like we had, I saw recently a hotel said they were doing retail media and I'm like, well, okay. Like, I guess, <laughs> you know, you do have a lot of first party data and, and maybe somebody is about to go out to a restaurant and you can influence them. Um, but I think of it like you think of it, I think, which is like very, very close to the transaction, low in the funnel. Uh, and I think that what's fascinating is like SEM, you know, I think there's there's a couple different uh, kind of main targeting scenarios, right? Like, what do you like? The customer is actually telling you what they're looking for, right? So that's the most powerful. Yeah, is I go search for dog food, right? Like I've just told you I'm looking for dog food, right? And then you and then you have a lot of other data. Uh, you know, maybe you know what they bought in the past. Maybe you know what type of dogs they have. Maybe you know they have a lot of brand loyalty to Purina but you're trying to get them to buy, you know, farmer's dog or like a newer brand. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, I think that's, you know, I think it's both that original intent, just like SEM. So like keyword category, you know, even, you know, where you are in a store. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I think the other big component is that is that first party purchase data that I think a lot of marketers, you know, aren't used to having when you look at like a Google. You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. I'm always super excited when people are innovating within the ad tech and martech space, so that's why I'm excited to chat with uh, James Avery who's the founder and CEO of Kevl. So let's start with the origin story, James. What was like that catalyst where you said, okay, I, I got to build this? Yeah, thank, thanks uh, thanks for having me on, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I mean, Kevl, Kevl really got started over 10 years ago uh, because I had a kind of an itch to scratch, which was I wanted to build a, a kind of bespoke native ad network uh, for a bunch of different bloggers. So this is back in you know the days of blogging. Uh, and I found that kind of every tool out there was kind of geared towards traditional publishers, was geared towards, you know, traditional banner ads. And I was like, why isn't there an, you know, an API for this, right? Why isn't there an AWS or a Twilio uh, for online advertising? And so I was like, well, I guess I'll just build it while I'm building this ad network. And so for, an, I feel for a little while, it was something I built just to, you know, use myself. And then I started to kind of sell it to other people. And then over the years, it's kind of gone from, you know, working with customers who are native, you know, you know, native ads or podcasting or video. And then of course now the, the kind of the biggest use case has become retail media, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's, it's really kind of similar to native in a way, but, but really reliant on APIs and, and customization. Yeah. I mean, retail media is, is really fun. Uh, now there are a lot of definitions of retail media, you know, some people say, oh, it's, it's at the physical location only. But then you've got folks who are saying, no, no, like Uber's ad network that's also retail media and you're like well is it a oh yeah sure okay all right so the and taxi tops is that retail media no it seems more like outdoor uh, but certainly you know when you look at the continuing of place-based advertising and retail media it, it it a lot of it especially if you're really defining it as retail media is lower part of the funnel right so it's an it's like sem in that those last touch points are really influential in breaking the tie between going one route for as a consumer or buyer and going another route. So, um, you know, what other elements of retail media, like from a targeting perspective or yield management perspective, end up being important from an ad server perspective? Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a couple different angles because uh, I think you're totally right. Like there's different there's different flavors of retail media, right? Like we had I saw recently a hotel said they were doing retail media. And I'm like, well, okay. Like, I guess, you know, you do have a lot of first party data and, and maybe somebody is about to go out to a restaurant and you can influence them. Um, but I think of it like you think of it, I think, which is like very, very close to the transaction, low in the funnel. Uh, and I think that what's fascinating is like SEM, you know, I think there's, there's a couple different uh, kind of main targeting scenarios, right? Like, what do you, like the customer is actually telling you what they're looking for, right? So that's the most powerful. Yeah. is I go search for dog food, right? Like I've just told you I'm looking for dog food, right? And then you and then you have a lot of other data. Uh, you know, maybe you know what they bought in the past. Maybe you know what type of dogs they have. Maybe you know they have a lot of brand loyalty to Purina, but you're trying to get them to buy, you know, Farmer's Dog or like a newer brand, mm -hmm. right? And so 
uh, I think that's, you know, I think it's both that original intent, just like SEM. So like keyword category, you know, even, you know, where you are in a store. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I think the other big component is that is that first party purchase data that I think a lot of marketers, you know, aren't used to having when you look at like a Google, right? Like I can't, right. I can't target it as well and say, oh, they, they searched for, you know, retail media ad server, but can I really target down to what else I know about them? Do I know they're at a retailer? Do I know they're at a food delivery company, right? Google might do some of that optimization for me, but I think the interesting thing is that retailers with that first party data can really start to share that. And they can say, oh, you know, Kevin has two Dobermans and he's going to buy hundreds of pounds of dog food a week. Like we can spend a lot of money on him, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I guess it's unusual com comparing retailers to publishers. They have much deeper first party data repositories. Uh, a lot of publishers are still struggling unless they're subscription-based publishers. They're just still struggling to get into double digits in some cases of percentage of viewers that that have a robust profile on. And so I, I guess that that first party PII and that permission relationship that the retailer has can end up being pretty pretty important from a targeting perspective. Yeah, yeah, I really think it's the it's probably the one of the biggest components that makes retail so enticing. And I think it's also why you see, you know, I'd say the third piece of retail media, like there's the on-site, but then also it's off-site. And how do you take that data and use it, you know, for off-site targeting, mm. which we don't we don't do a lot in that space. Uh, but I think that is kind of the other area where because you have this rich retail media, they know you have these dogs and buy dog food. How do we target you when you're over on Salon or or New York Times or something like that, right? Right, right. So it's a hot area. And how big should a retailer be or let's say a franchise franchisor, right? Because you may maybe even situations where a franchisor can engage the franchisees in becoming that retail media network and work out the, the math later. So how big should somebody be before they sort of look seriously at engaging with you or others to, to build a re retail media network? Yeah, I, th I think it really, the way we look at it is kind of as a percentage of of GMV, right? So how much merchandise are they moving as mm. a retailer? And then also what percentage of that is online, right? Because if they're, if they're somebody who is doing almost all offline, you know, you're only just going into a little, you know, bodega to, to buy chips and drinks and stuff like that, right? Like there, there's, of course, there's an opportunity, right? Like Doritos will buy an end cap and, and kind of what we, you know, thought of as traditional in store. Uh, but digitally, there may be not as much an opportunity. Uh, the fascinating thing is like we can learn from looking at like Amazon, right? We, we kind of look at Amazon as it's like it is the most evolved, the most optimized, you know, retail media network right i mean i think there's right. something i mean they're over 50 percent of of retail media revenue or like spend in the category is amazon right uh and we can kind of look at what percentage of gmv do they make and it's you know it continues to go up right like it's i think the latest was it's north of 15 percent. now if you're starting out you're not going to be at 15 percent, right a lot of times brand new retail media networks might get to one percent of gmv and so the retailer can kind of do the math and they can say, okay, well, if we're doing $100 million a year in GMV, when we start out, we might only make a million dollars a year, but we can get it to, you know, maybe 10 to 15 million a year. Now, if they're doing like 10 billion, right? Obviously, that's a lot better. There's a, there's a lot more opportunity there. And so it, it all, you know, I think that's kind of the way to look at it. Uh, and then I'd also add, I think one other lens, one other way to look at it is how important are you to the marketer? How important are you to the brand? And so when you think about like, even if you were a, you know, if you're kind of in the, you know, pet food space, right, they might say, okay, well, our number one place is going to be Amazon and then Walmart and then Chewy, you know, and it's like, are you number four or would you be like number 50? And if you were like number 50, that's going to be hard to get an advertiser to come spend time, you know, buy directly with you or buy through your self-serve, right? So it's probably not going to be worth it, but you know, let's say you're, you know, a niche watch, you know, retailer, right? You might be really small, but if you're the, you know, one of the top three places or one of the, you know, top two watch retailers, then those brands might come and spend with you. And so that's another reason I think that can be really like another good way to look at should you build, you know, a retail media network or not. That's interesting. And and for the multi-channel retailer, I know 
you know, last time I looked at it from a technology perspective, the the online and offline POSs were not linked. And I've seen a lot of advances advancement in the last 10 or 12 years where now they have a unified customer database and sometimes they're quite unified from a POS perspective. And of course, Shopify is like trying to actually sell you a, a unified system, right, with regards to online and offline POS. Does that end up being important from a, a data richness perspective? Yeah, and I, and I think it really, like a lot of the customers we're working with now, a big part of it too is really tracking that online, offline, like offline attribution. Right. Right, like I think especially in the grocery space, Somebody might go research online. They might they might look at some stuff. They might see, oh, do they have this in stock? But then they're not going to like order it, and they're they're going to go down to the store and pick it up. And and especially places like grocery with such a strong like loyalty card, right? We all use our loyalty cards, so they they can really a lot of times do that offline attribution, which is just another way to really kind of drive that spend. Uh, right. So I think that that you know, and then and whether it's in stock or not, right? That was a big thing early on was. You know, we have to kind of tie together, you know, you don't want to advertise stuff that's not in stock. And so you want to know, is it in stock online, but also maybe is it in stock at those, you know, the three retailers around this person, right? And so there's, there's kind of, there's a lot that, a lot that goes into it that makes it more complex than, than kind of traditional, I'm going to put a nice banner ad on a, on an article. <laughs> uh, for sure. And, and, uh, for retailers who are sort of in in their early stages of of sort of deploying their retail media networks, do they have to basically rep all their own demand, or is there a way a way for them to plug into you know ad networks and other other locations because you know they already have an ice cream advertiser or they already have a cosmetics advertiser, or do they have to sort of go out and sort of hit the ground running and and rep all their own inventory? Yeah, so they're they're definitely what we've kind of seen is as as the markets evolved, a lot of people started out by using one of these kind of more like ad networks, right? Like we've all like Critio has been around forever. You know, retailer can can use Critio, can get some of that demand. Critio has a lot of salespeople, has a lot of you know big brand relationships. They can bring that demand in, mm -hmm. and we kind of see that as like that's where that's where a lot of people have started out. Right. And then I think as they, and then, you know, if you look at somebody like a Walmart, right? Like they started out outsourcing it, right? They were like, great, somebody's going to write us a check. And then <laughs> they, then they kind of look at Amazon and they say, huh, Amazon's making a lot more money than we are. What do we do here? And yeah. so they, and now they've, they've built their own, they've invested in it. They've, they've kind of continued to move on. And so I think that's kind of what we, the path we see a lot of retailers taking is they, they wanted to get zero to one. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get that check in the mail. And now they're saying, okay, how do we really make this a, you know, 10% of GMV business versus a one or 2% of GMV business? Right, right. Uh, is there any difference in what ad formats work best in a retail media environment? Is it different by industry category? You know, do you, can you sort of guide, you know, folks and say, oh, it's, it should be mostly video or it should be mostly display or, or you know, yeah, how much real estate they should uh, sort of screen real estate or even physical real estate if they're going to deploy in stores should they give to to the ads? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's honestly fairly similar to the rest of advertising where you know video is going to usually do better. Uh, you know, a larger native unit is going to do better than a you know old school seven twenty eight by ninety. Right. Like the, those things are true. I think uh, promoted listings, though, are something that's pretty unique to retail media that that tend to kind of operate in their own way. Right. Because mm -hmm. it, it needs to be really integrated. It needs to be an actual promoted listing. Kind of the early stage was it was like an ad that looked like a promoted listing like that doesn't really count. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and we can all like, like always we can look to Amazon and see that they, you know, they've been building some really great units like kind of a video branded shelf where it's a it's a video unit and it's like three or four sponsored listings so if we go back to like the dog food commercial it might be a you know pur purina ad and then it's the three you know three product listings that are are really based on the relevancy of what you've bought in the past or what they think you might like or what they're trying to promote and so i think you start to see those kind of like innovative units that you know weren't weren't really prevalent outside of retail right I guess that the, some retailers have a strategic decision to make because they have in-house brands, right? And so do they just go ahead and get the external money from the, the manufacturers who want to get in front of those eyeballs? Or do they say, but wait a minute, we have an in-house brand too. 
And do they sort of force an internal PL like, oh, you know, well, in order to give you this real estate, I'm going to give up money from Purina. So you got, you know, we've got to make charge for it. It's not really a house ad, right? How do they yeah. deal with that decision? Yeah, it's it's really, I think it's one of the things that makes retail so much more complex is is kind of that like the relevancy angle and and also you know i think the house at or the uh kind of the house brand is one way to to think about it because yeah they they also get a different margin right because right. sometimes they might sometimes they might make more if you buy that purina than if you buy the house brand right, right. like they maybe they want maybe they only want the house brand because they want to be able to say they're cheaper but then they want you to buy the purina and so then you have to factor in, well, how much will is Purina going to pay us in ad spend? Right. And you're right. So you you really have to be able to optimize this across both like relevancy as well as really like margin. Yeah. Right. And margins never, it's never an exact calculation, but most retailers have an idea of like, what is this a low, medium or high margin item? What is our, what's our net on it roughly? And then you have to kind of factor all of that in. So it's yeah. one of the things that definitely makes it more complex. Uh, you sure. see this, like, I know I keep mentioning Amazon, but they really have, you know, figured a lot of this out. You know, you'll see where they they have, they've started to kind of have, sometimes it'll be one unit that gets to be like the, the Amazon brand. And you can just imagine there was some debate internally of like, look, give us one, you got to give us one spot. Like, we're going to use this spot to, to put our like, you know, 365 brand but then the, the other ones you can sell whatever, away, yeah. right? And yeah. so there's, you know, sometimes it's science, sometimes it's politics, <laughs> right? I think it's somewhere between the two. Yeah, I mean, you, you one one thing that keeps coming up is the the relevancy factor, right? Because the relevancy can be contextually driven or based on the SKUs uh, or the category that the person's engaging in, and then of course you've also got the PI of the the back end data. So, you know. Uh, how can retailers use that additional layer of information to really delight their 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 customers, right? By by upping relevance beyond just contextual. Yeah, and I think like and it's it's one of the interesting things we're seeing with like the opportunity in different kinds of ad units, like recommendations, right? Right, and, and you know, so you're on there and you're buying, you know, you're ordering hot dogs on Instacart, you know. You can show me sponsored hot dogs. That's great. Maybe I'll maybe I'll buy the the type that you want. But you could also say, here's a package with with the buns we know you're about to buy, <laughs> and the you know and a you know a special ketchup that that Heinz is trying to promote. You know, right. and how do you, so how do you, you know it's not just like hey we're going to show you promoted hot dogs because you search for hot dogs, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity there, right? Um, do you find that sometimes you'll go in and and either due to a more antiquated CMS uh, or, or sort of cataloging or e-commerce platform, they don't have the 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 good page level schemas like to to allow you to do that targeting. Do you end up sometimes having to retrofit your ad calls and your ability? Like, or do you have to actually end up crawling and creating your own schema to overlay on top of everything, or or is there a way? Is there is sort of like a, a baby steps that retailers can take? Yeah, I think there's definitely there's definitely baby steps. I mean, like we we ingest their product catalog, yeah. right? Which is kind of the first part. We have to have that full catalog, uh, but then also, you know, they can start out saying we're going to do just sponsored listings, and that means we're integrating with their, you know, either their in-house search or they're working with like an Algolia or someone like that. Right. And like, how do you do that integration? Uh, or sometimes it's a, you know, they really want to do a lot more on the CMS side, and then it is how flexible is that CMS? How you know, how can we get the category level data? What's your category hierarchy? Uh, we've even found a lot of these category hierarchies differ from in store and online, right? Ah, so there's there's a lot there's some mappings that have to happen there. Oh, I hadn't even thought about like broken taxonomies that don't even match right, between. Yeah, and I think sometimes story. there's good reasons they don't match, yeah. right? Like, because you think about like how you how you how you would search in a store a lot of times is different than how you would search you know, in a digital world where there's right. not the cost of going from, you don't have to walk to the other end of the store, right? <laughs> right, for sure. Um, you know, w when these, when the stores have sort of a moderate level of PII because they've, they've got this permission relationship, are they also sometimes augmenting that with third-party identity graph data and sort of saying, well, Experian knows exactly, you know, which t-shirt I bought like seven years ago from a different retailer and that would be really useful to know, <laughs> you know or or third other third party data sets. Uh, are yeah, they tapping you know, into those? We we haven't seen that a lot yet with the retailers we're working with. 
Um, and Amazon might, but you know, they haven't told us if they are, <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of a, it's a kind of a logical extension, right? Because they have that true identity. Yeah. And I think the other thing that we were starting to see though, is where is that brand data, hmm. right? Is what does, what does Procter and Gamble know? You know, and so it's it's less of like the Experian knows it and more of, well, how do you let Procter & Gamble say, well, we know a lot about Kevin because, yes, he he does go buy from Kroger, but then every once in a while, we also figured out that he goes and buys from, you know, Albertsons down the street. And and so we actually have a better idea of his buying habits. And and yeah, he hasn't bought razors at, at Kroger in six months, but we, all, we know he bought them at Albertsons last week or he bought them on Amazon or any other data that they can kind of stitch together. So I think where you're really going to start to see is like, where can the brands bring their third party data in? Or, you know, I guess it's kind of first party data. I don't know. Second party data. Uh, where, where can they, where can they bring that into play with the individual retailer to build yeah. kind of a more complete like profile? Well, wow, that, that's really fascinating. Cause I never thought about the, the, the brands having that level of data, but they're licensing it often from, from store, you know, retail stores. Yeah. They're either getting it from the retailers or they're going yeah. to an Experian or they're, they're trying to find that data. And so yeah. it's like, they, you know, uh, it's kind of like, I don't think Albertsons would want to share directly with Kroger. I guess not, not yet, uh, <laughs> but you know, they wouldn't want to share directly, but indirectly it ends up, it could be getting shared through a brand, right? Cause right. a brand can buy that data from both of them, kind of push it together and then push it back down to one of them to use yeah. for targeting. It's like re retail media clean rooms. Like it's my smoke's coming out of my ears from that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think clean it's, and I would say it's still, I mean, a lot of these retailers are still pretty early. Like we kind of think yeah. of it as like a model where, you know, they're, they're kind of still in the early days, but I think when we think about where, where will this eventually go? Yeah. Right. I think that's one of the areas that we'll see more of. Are, are there retail sectors that you think have the most upside just because they haven't been, they haven't been thinking about the additional margin and revenue that they can get from advertising? No, I mean, I think that it's the ones that you would expect, I think, are the ones where there's the most upside, right? The ones mm -hmm. with large ticket items. You know, you think of the like Home Depots and Lowe's and where you're buying a refrigerator or a lawnmower, uh, you know, places like Pet Food and, and you know, CPG, right? Uh, I think that the ones where there probably has been less, but there will be more is really the specialty, right? As you get into more of, you know, think of like a tractor supply or somebody, right? Like, I feel like there's probably a lot of opportunity there probably hasn't worked its way, you know, as much into those more like specialty high end uh, retailers. Interesting. Is there anything that's uh, super exciting for you over the next year, either industry wide or maybe uh, stuff that you're allowed to talk about with regards to the product roadmap? I mean, AI is on everybody's minds, but, you know, other than AI or maybe it is AI, what's got you excited about uh, the next year? Yeah. So one of the, it actually, it ties back into one of your earlier questions kind of around what's available from like a network standpoint. Right. Uh, we started some work and we've now partnered with the IAB to try to really build the uh, open RTB standard for promoted listings. Mm. So the way I think about it is like, mm. if you are Procter and Gamble and you want to, you know, you're trying to sell diapers in this given zip code. Right. Do you really care if that promoted listing is on Kroger's website, in the Instacart app, in the, you know, you know, DoorDash convenience or or wherever it is? You don't really care that, right? You really you want the performance. And so this work that we've been doing, I think, is really going to open up the ability to do true retail media promoted listings in a pragmatic way. And so I think they'll, you know, they could go into the trade desk and say, I'm trying to, you know, deliver sales in this area go run ads, right? right? Track the performance. And I think that that's really going to unlock a lot of demand for these retailers in a very kind of open and programmatic way. Whereas today it's kind of still back in that ad network day, mm. right? And for those of us that have been in this industry a long time, you just see the same thing happen, right? It's like ad network, and then it starts to transition to supply side, buy side. You're going to get some programmatic in the middle, some exchanges, bring in data, right? So I think we're, we're seeing that same thing play out, uh, but it's really exciting to be kind of part of the solution and, and really building this. And I think in the right way, so that it's not going to be like fake promoted listings. It will be an actual <laughs> real promoted listing for an item that's in stock, but that's bought through a DSP. Yeah, I mean, and it sounds like it's got a similar structure depending on the size of the retailer between in-house sales teams and programmatic backfilled as well, right? So just a lot of things we've seen before, right? Because 
if there are in-house sales teams, they're going to want to say, oh, no, no, I, you know, I've got that relationship with Purina. And and you've got the added thing, which I hadn't even thought about, which is sort of co-op dollars, right? Yep. Which exist in the retail environment um, and, and are sort of like, they, they, they're real money, but they're also monopoly money at the same time, right? And you could you could sort of potentially deploy the co-op dollars within your own retail media network or externally, uh, yeah. which is really an interesting um, yeah, strategic I, decision. Yeah, and, and like you were like, I think it's it's good to reiterate what you just said around kind of what are the the big direct versus pragmatic, right? Because if and I think I think of it from the brand perspective too, of where if you're if you're Procter and Gamble, like, of course, you have a big relationship with Kroger and you, you know, you're going to be working with your person at Kroger. They're not going to want you to buy that pragmatically. It's going to be this direct relationship. But if you think of like 7-Eleven, right? Like 7-Eleven has been building the retail media network. It's like, are they going to be big enough? Do they sell enough diapers that Procter and Gamble wants to go and have a direct relationship? Does 7-Eleven want to do that? You know, maybe they want it. They care about Gatorade and Red Bull and you know, and the people that, you know, those items, yeah. but this is a way for Procter and Gamble to be like, yeah, yeah. We also want coverage in 7-Eleven. We want, you know, somebody's on the 7-Eleven app to promote the papers listing, but I don't want to fill out an IO for it or have a relationship. I want to put it in the trade desk and see if it works. Right. Right. Yeah. That's going to be inter interesting to watch the evolution. Uh, thanks so much, James, for jumping on and, and sharing the, the, you know, the, the evolution of the retail media networks and how you guys are playing in that, in that category. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me on. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe, or follow.